Hello, everyone, and welcome back. During our next presentation of Celligence's Virtual Medical Device Summit, it will be titled Process and Technology Innovation in EU MDR Compliance. So just to give you a quick agenda of what we're going to be going over during this presentation, we will start with an introduction about Celligence from myself. Then we will review the challenges that the EU MDR presents. And then we will view the EU MDR as an opportunity that Shruti, my colleague here, will expand on, as well as a technology overview and demo of our solution for MDR compliance, followed by the conclusions. So to provide you with just a brief background about Celligence, uh, we were formed in 2017, almost four years ago now, with the intent of improving quality and compliance while at the same time reducing costs for the life sciences industry in the area of regulatory affairs. Now today, we serve over a dozen customers worldwide, ranging from small to major sized companies, including Novartis, Johnson & Johnson, and Bausch Health. And you can see a short list on the right here. Now we provide niche regulatory affairs services, such as MDR and IBDR gap analyses, CER writing, device registration, as well as ECT publishing and other pharmaceutical support as well. But we offer many, many options for operational and strategic support in the area of regulatory and quality affairs for global device compliance. So now just to give you a brief background of Shruti. So Shruti Sharma is a senior medical writer here at Celligence, um, and she'll be joining me on the line in a moment here. Um, she has well over five years of experience in medical writing specializing in clinical evaluation of medical devices across a wide range of therapeutic areas, some of which you can see under the first bullet point here. Now, she has authored a variety of regulatory documents, including clinical evaluation plans, clinical evaluation port reports, and these were for unique product types such as software as a medical device, as well as drug device combination products. Now, in her experience, she's developed MDR compliant, comprehensive CEP and CER templates for medical device manufacturers, tailored to the precise requirements of their product portfolio, portfolio based on MDCG and IMDRF guidance documents, and has a wealth of experience working with the observations from notified bodies and being able to provide responses to their queries and observations. So now I would like my colleague here, Shruti, to hop on the line for our feature presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Dylan. In 2017, the European Medical Device Regulation, or the EU MDR, was published, which defines a new set of regulations governing the production and sale of medical devices in Europe. Compliance to this regulation is essential for manufacturers wanting to sell their devices in the European market. My presentation today will focus on a few of the challenges and new requirements introduced by the MDR, how manufacturers can address these challenges and how they can leverage technology to make the process easier and more efficient. In this session, we're going to talk about some of the new requirements surrounding post-market surveillance and clinical evaluations. We'll also be looking at how MDR can be a brilliant opportunity for manufacturers to have a positive impact on their businesses, how they can use this process for business transformation. We'll also look at the importance of a single source of truth to harmonize information across their documentation. And I'll also give a brief demo of our cloud-based EU MDR compliance platform, which saves 20% of time for our medical writing team. Let's look at some of the major challenges brought on by the EU MDR. The MDR has had an impact on the people, process, and tools required by an organization. There are new requirements surrounding the kind of people and skill set manufacturers now require in their teams. New processes and SOPs have to be introduced. Manufacturers also need to be now equipped with specialized tools to help them work more efficiently. There is an evident increase in the cost of operations. Reviews and interactions with the notified body are much more comprehensive. There are significant changes surrounding UDI and also an increased responsibility on all economic operators. There is an increased emphasis on post-market surveillance surrounding proactively monitoring device performance for recertification and annual safety updates for higher risk class devices. The process of sharing internal device information to the public versus regulators has also now changed. Manufacturers are now expected to publish device data on platforms available to the public 
and also provide more in-depth information the proper justifications for information they provide to the regulators internal data management now needs to be more robust with higher traceability the same set of data will feed into multiple reports that are required by the mdr essentially meaning there now needs to be a single source of truth external data just like the internal data set is also multi-use data extraction from external sources like literature databases needs more efficiency in terms of building a uniform data set i will talk about internal and external data sets in detail in the coming slides so now we come to the next point what do manufacturers need to do starting off they need to enhance the skill sets of their current teams they need to look back into their ra and qa teams and understand how they can be upskilled so that they understand mdr requirements and are also able to implement these changes manufacturers need to look back into their existing processes surrounding clinical evaluations pms or risk and see if any of these processes need to be revised there's also appointment of the prrc role in the organization which is the person responsible for regulatory compliance manufacturers need to reassess clinical data for the devices which are already there in the market you need to assess whether this data is sufficient whether additional testing is required or maybe say a pmcf needs to be planned they also need to establish processes related to data and information collection and this is important because requirements around say the udi requires submissions in a very structured format whereas reporting requirements for reports like the pms or cer sscp they are slightly more free form there are guidelines in place but manufacturers still need to create their own templates and ultimately manufacturers need to align the processes and technologies for information exchange in the udmed would it be manual or would it be automated is something that needs to be looked into now let's talk about data sources for eu mdr reports the report the report that you see on the left column are some of the mandatory documents that manufacturers need to generate and provide as part of their compliance with the eu mdr these documents are living documents that means as long as the product is there in the market these documents have to be updated periodically depending on the risk class of the device or as and when new safety information is updated that could trigger an update some of these reports were required as part of the previous regulation like the CER risk management and the PMSR while others like the SSCP and PSU are new requirements internal data sources usually come from the technical file but the technical file in, in itself is enormous the kind of data sources that we are interested in comes from the IFU the user manuals your verification and validation tests any preclinical studies or clinical investigations claims and clinical benefits of the device any pre market surveys or voice of customers if they were conducted all the risk documents especially the fmeas the device claims matrix and also any previous clinical evaluations post market data that we look at can, uh, consists of sales data any complaints data the complaints rate which is calculated the carpas any hhes or field actions or recalls or any vigilance reports if any of these occurred they need to be reported in these reports coming to external data sources they can be of three major they can be categorized under three major headings so the first one can be your literature sources the next you have clinical trial registries and the third one is your adverse events databases adverse events can be further branched out into specific cyber security databases if your device is a software now this list is also not exhaustive there can be a lot many data sources depending on the device type and the risk category it falls in there are databases from other countries say japan or other european countries like swiss medic that you can also look into individual sections of the reports that you see on the left and the presentation of data in these reports may change but a major chunk of information that goes into each of these reports is fairly common for example literature is something which is analyzed in the cer the sscp the psur and the pmsr analysis of the same literature will determine the direction of the pmcf evaluation and the risk management report the same applies for adverse events also the data set that you see on the right all your data sources so essentially these data sources are very versatile meaning the same data is going into multiple reports the same applies for internal sources also now this versatility of data is great but how do you track it how do you ensure that all pivotal data captured while creating one report has also been transferred to another 
manufacturers usually have a very robust QMS system for handling their internal data. They have a systematic approach to handling and updating their internal documentation. However, systematically handling and keeping track of data gathered from external sources is a challenge, mostly because there are multiple sources of information like we saw, and no two sources give the same kind of interaction to the user. Let's take an example of literature sources. Now, no two sites that you see here will have the same kind of interaction with the user. How you conduct your searches, how you filter your searches, how you export them, and even the data which is exported from these websites varies from site to site. There is a need for a systematic process to gather and store information from these databases as a uniform data set. Notified bodies are also now interested in how you gather your information and how, what you present in your reports and what strategy you follow to get to your pivotal data. One must also keep in mind the intended audience for this report and how to present data in a way which is clear and easy to understand. I'd also like to highlight that every update you make to your report, you get a new set of data that is gathered for that review period. Notified bodies are focusing on clinical evidence in support for the device or the device technology. We've had instances where the notified bodies asked us to expand the date range of the searches. That means you have one data set from the existing search to which you now have to add another for the expanded time frame. Instances like these where you have to search, consolidate and track large data sets from multiple sources. It's very labor intensive and is a very huge resource burden. Now, there's a lot that I've spoken about, and there's still a lot that can be spoken about the challenges and the implications of the EUMDR. What I want us to do is now to look beyond these challenges and ask ourselves, how do we turn this into an opportunity? What are the positive impacts of these changes, and how can manufacturers make this work in their favor? To start with, you can leverage your end user. It is 2021. Your end user is educated, is curious, and has access to a lot more resources and information that they did not before. Users have increased awareness of the device status, how long the device has been on the market, if it was ever recalled, were there any field safety actions against it. Reports like the SSCP, which have to be published on the Udemy, can be accessed by the public. This publicly available information will allow users to make better decisions when choosing a device or when a device is recommended to them. They can now look and compare information from different brands offering similar devices. This itself is an excellent opportunity to instill confidence in the people who will use these devices. Data published on Udemy can provide manufacturers a competitive advantage also. They now have access to competitor data that they did not before and can use this data to guide and improve their device's design and risk calculations. Increased emphasis on PMS will improve the manufacturer's understanding of their device's clinical benefits. Apart from meeting compliance requirements, we are looking at increased safety of the devices and the industry overall. There are also commercial advantages to this. Legacy devices which have been out for decades previously did not require clinical trials are now required to provide safety data too. It is often not financially worth the investment to get them to MDR standards based on low sales or low profitability. Manufacturers are re-evaluating entire product lines under what is called portfolio optimization. Devices that don't make the cut can be phased out and where possible replaced by other similar products within the portfolio. Talking about UDI, UDI is now allowing manufacturers and other stakeholders in the supply chain to reduce counterfeit products. They can improve inventory management. You can identify flawed devices, reduce medical errors, provide more information to patient treatment, facilitate worldwide medical device identification, and also give manufacturers increased lead time to identify imminent issues. Now, these benefits may be realized in the long term, but in the short term, a lot of companies are still struggling to be ready to comply with the EU MDR. According to a study done recently, despite the year-long extension, 53% of manufacturers mentioned not having enough time or budget to make these changes. Finding skilled, technical, analytical, and clinically sound resources 
to make these changes is a top challenge faced by the medtech industry at the moment. It is wise to consider where you as a manufacturer may need support from a consulting firm or a services provider, or even examine the landscape of an innovative technology provider to overcome these challenges. Manufacturers can consult and offload several of their regulatory workload to external vendors and consultants. External vendors can help you with your MDR gap analysis. They can provide you consulting regarding UD, UDI, UDMED, PMS, or other topics. They can help you with your medical writing tasks, which is technical file remediations or authoring your CERs or PMSRs, SSCPs, or other documents. They'll help you with global medical device registrations and also regulatory intelligence consulting. Manufacturers can also leverage technology to bring efficiency to their regulatory processes. Technology can help maintain reliability and reproducibility of data, and also help maintain consistency of information across all documentation required under the MDR. For example, technology can help you with your technical validations, electronic submissions, planning and governance processes. It'll help you manage your product portfolio. It can help you author your reports and also archive them and also help you collaborate within your teams. And the best part is it is customizable. You can always customize it to suit your needs and requirements. The technology provider can also explore your current process and optimize it by automating certain tasks. I would now like to introduce you to a Captus technology platform, which was developed keeping in mind the manufacturer's perspective for MDR compliance. Some key features offered by this technology solution include support with document lifecycle management, it will help your teams collaborate. There are predefined reports which can be generated for user roles. It will help you with project management, task management. There's also integration with literature databases and article management. It can automate several repetitive manual activities as well as trivial tasks like data consolidation or formatting. It is also integrated with TPLC for PMS information and will ultimately help you with your data and document validation. Let us now take a quick glimpse into our EU MDR platform. This has helped our medical writing team achieve up to 20% time savings in their literature evaluation. Let me quickly jump to our platform. So this platform is a web-based application. That means as long as you have an internet connection, you can access it. What you see here is now my search page. This is where I record all the searches that I've conducted. I've already saved one search which I've conducted on Google Scholar. This platform can support PubMed, Google Scholar, Embase, Cochrane, and Prospero at the moment. To conduct a new search, you can tell the platform which database you're looking at and also what kind of search you're looking at. Will it be for your device under evaluation or state of the art? You can specify that. So I want to conduct a search on PubMed for my device under evaluation. I have a search string ready. I can choose which date range I'm looking for. Suppose I'm looking at May 2020 to May 2021. You can also specify if there are certain article types that you're interested in. The search, I won't choose any and I can hit search. I now have 25 results from PubMed. If you think or when you are doing the search, if you think that this is not something that is relevant to you, or if you want to conduct a new search, you can always edit right from here. Or if you think that this is something that looks relevant, you can save it. I will save this search. So once I save the search, let me go back to my search homepage. The search has now been saved. I have two saved searches, one from Google Scholar and one from PubMed. If you notice, the platform has automatically recorded all filters and what date the search was conducted. Now, compliance to EU MDR also means that you have to now record your search strategy. Notified bodies want to look at how you arrived at the search results that you're reporting in these reports. So earlier, I would have had to manually record each of these filters that I used for each of these search strings. Now, the platform automatically records it for me. Now, I don't have to worry about recording my search strategy anywhere. As in when I conduct a search, my search strategy is automatically recorded by the platform. So once I have my searches ready, I can continue with screening them. 
systematic literature review typically involves two levels of screening. You have level one, where you look at articles and abstracts, and level two is where you look at the full text. So before you even begin your L1, as in when you keep saving your searches, the platform will deduplicate articles in the background because these articles come from multiple data sources and also there can be multiple search strings when you do your searches. It's quite possible that you will have duplicate articles. The best part about this platform is that I don't have to save searches anymore. That means even if I conduct searches on different platforms or different databases, sorry, or if I use multiple search strings, the task of consolidating my search results into one uniform data set is not, not my responsibility anymore. My team and I save a lot of time where we don't have to save and consolidate anymore because the platform is doing it for us. To begin your L1 review, you can use a filter here on the right which says action spending, which is all the articles for which I haven't yet taken a decision yet. I can choose one. I can read the title here, the abstract and take a decision. You can also toggle the view. So I think that this article is something that can be included. I can use this button here and call it an include. This article is now included in my full, in my literature review. Let's jump on to the next article. Let's make a couple of example inclusions. Okay, now what if you have to exclude an article? I look at the abstract and I think that this is not something that I am interested in. So I can use the same button here and exclude it from here. There is a drop down menu from which I can choose my exclusion reason. Now these reasons are something which I configured when I was configuring this, plus this project. You can configure your own reasons when you configure your project and you can also save them as a template so that when you do future projects, you can always always reload a template and you don't have to fill in these reasons again. So uh, suppose I think that this article contains no relevant safety or performance data. I can choose this reason and okay. Another feature I'd like to highlight is you can send articles directly to your state of the art, meaning searches Articles from one kind of search can be automatically sent to another using this toggle button here. It is uh, quite possible that when I'm searching for uh, articles on my device, I may come across articles which are actually more applicable for my state of the art section. So instead of doing the search again for my state of the art, I can exclude it for my device under evaluation and use this button here and send my articles to SOTA. So when I jump on to my state of the art section, which is this button, I now have these articles which I sent from my device under evaluation. If I was to do this manually, this would have been uh, quite time consuming to track each of these articles which are coming from different sources. Now jumping on to L2, before you even start your L2, you must ensure that you have the full text PDF of the article with you. Now, if some of these articles have free PDFs available on the website itself, the, the platform will automatically download them for me. Now, if you see this filter here, it says has article. That means six of these articles. For six of these articles, the platform could find PDFs and it automatically downloaded them for me, reducing my task of finding these articles. If you have articles uh, for which the platform could not find PDFs, it's probably, it's, uh, probably because it was a paid article, maybe you require a subscription. What you can do is you can mark it with a tag. You can tag it using this tag called to be purchased. You can even configure your own tags if you want them to. And if I go back to my L2 review page, I can filter with this tag specifically and export this list into an Excel sheet and send it to my purchase department so that they can buy this article for me. While they buy this article, I can move on with my articles for which I have the PDFs and continue my screening. So uh, let's go to articles which have actions pending against them. And I can also put another filter for has article. That means I can screen these two articles right now. Let's go to the first one. So 
So in my L2 review, I can see the PDF on my left. To begin reviewing, I can hit review here. And the platform now gives me a set of questions that I need to answer. These questions were also configured by me. I used the IMDRF guidelines to configure these questions. I configured only four of them for this demo. I can toggle my view here. So you can read through the article and then keep answering questions as you read along. So I so let's read this article. I think this has our actual device, for example. It is used for the same intended purpose. I think the applicable population is also correct. And it is a high quality article. Before we complete our review, I'd like to show you a nifty feature that the platform gives us. So assuming this is some text that is important. It is giving me some kind of say, safety information or performance information that I can use in some other section of my CER. I can use this option. I can highlight it and right click. And there is a highlight button here. I can now choose a tag. Is it performance or safety or risk? Whichever is applicable, you can even configure your own tags if you want to. I think this could give me, say, some safety data and risk data. And I can click OK. Let's go back to our review. And I complete it. I have configured a score based evaluation here. So if certain articles fall under a, a particular score, you can include it or exclude it. This is also optional. You can choose not to have a score based evaluation and go only for a grade based evaluation. Or if you want to have only one list of questions, that is also a possibility. So we finally include this article. So once I have all my L2 done, let me jump on to reports. The platform automatically generates a lot of reports for us. For example, let's look at search parameters. So this is basically a table which is giving me search strategy which I used for my searches. This is something which has to be recorded in each of those reports like the CER or the PMSR, the PSUR. Whenever you have conducted a literature search, I can use these toggles to show me more information uh, surrounding, say, any exclusions which I made. Now, this is something I can directly copy and paste into my Word document. I can use this button on top, and then I can paste it directly into my Word document. The platform also gives you other kinds of reports which you can use directly in your appendices. So reports like these, where you have to show your entire search result and what action was taken against each article. This is something that the platform can generate for you. You can also ask the platform to give you, say, more columns if you have, if you want to see which database these results came from. That's also a possibility. This again, I can directly copy using this button and paste into my document. The platform is also integrated with TPLC and MOD, where I can do my searches here directly. Let's quickly go back to the highlight section, which we made before. So article highlights can be accessed here. This is where all my article highlights were made. Uh, if I want to see only safety highlights, I can do that. I can click on a particular article, and the platform will take me to the parent article. We will now jump back to our presentation. You can always reach out to us, and we will be happy to give you a full demonstration of all the capabilities of our platform. So that was our technology platform to sum up my talk tonight. The primary implications of the EU MDR are the significant remediation costs and the need for additional skilled technical resources. The medtech industry should be looking across product lifecycle processes to see where processes, people, and technology can be updated to increase efficiency. Although the industry is currently looking at near-term challenges with compliance, especially with regards to skilled resources, there are many areas where new requirements will benefit the medtech industry in the long term. For example, I covered portfolio optimization or traceability through UDI, and also how manufacturers can gain a competitive edge through publicly available data. There is a significant influx of information from internal and external sources like we saw. This may seem to be a challenge right now, but it will ultimately allow manufacturers to make better decisions for their devices. As I had demonstrated, 
there are several areas where automation and technology can reduce manual activity, save time, and improve the management of the living documents required for ongoing EU MDR compliance. Our technology roadmap includes features that will assist our clients in overcoming challenges related to report creation and maintenance. In the near term, manufacturers can consider leveraging external vendors and benefit with increased process efficiency, improved deliverable quality, and ensured compliance. A mutually beneficial agreement will also help manufacturers achieve an overall reduction in their EU MDR writing costs. With this, we come to the end of my presentation today. Thank you so much for joining me. I now open the floor for any questions that you may have. Thank you so much for that presentation, Shruti. Um, I would now to, like to invite you back on the line here so that we can begin our Q&A session. Um, I would also like to encourage any of the audience members, if you have any questions for Shruti, feel free to put them in the chat. We'll start in one moment here. Looks like she's coming up on the line here now. One more moment. Okay, should just be another couple seconds here. Appreciate the patience. And while we're getting set up here, if you have any further questions, feel free to put them in the chat box now. And again, if you have any problems with the stream, um, it is actually, uh, we're being broadcast from a wired connection right now. So um, it, it is likely, it is probably your own network issue. So feel free to refresh the page or maybe restart your connection if need be. Okay, here we go. Welcoming Shruti back on the line here. Hi, Dylan. Thank you. Hi, Shruti. How are you? Thank you. Glad we worked that out. Good. Yeah. Uh, thank you for that wonderful presentation. Um, I know our audience members, as as myself, found it very informative and useful. Um, is there anything you just wanted to quickly mention before we uh, jump into our Q and A here? Uh, I think we can begin. Yeah, please continue. Sounds good to me. Okay. So the first question we have here is: When is a periodic safety update report required? Uh, so a PSUR would be required for class three devices and class two devices, which are implantable for devices, which are higher risk, like class three, you would require them annually and uh, lower risk devices like class two devices, it would be required on a two year basis. Okay. Thank you for that. It's straightforward. Okay. The next question we have here is um, kind of a hypothetical situation here. We often have literature results in the thousands, sometimes well over three or 4,000. What is the best way to organize this data? Okay, so uh, starting off, uh, if you are conducting a literature search and you see your results in thousands, uh, you must first look at your search results. Uh, look at say page one or page two and see if the results seem relevant enough. Are they from, from the same therapeutic area for the same indication? If not, then you can start by altering your search results. How you can do that is you can make your search string more specific. You can add more keywords to the kind of results that you're looking for, or you can even add keywords for uh, negative words, or say the kind of words that you don't want. Say I put up negative keywords for case studies maybe. So I, I'm not looking for case studies on uh, platforms like PubMed. You can use the not Boolean operator. 
on platforms like Google Scholar, you can use the minus operator to do. So uh, once you have altered your search results, once you've narrowed down your search results to a sizable number, and the search results also look relevant, I would suggest then you export them out to a separate uh, file. Like, do not conduct your screenings on the platform itself. You cannot track it. So platforms like PubMed and Embase, they allow you to export the search results out, uh, into an Excel sheet. So you, you must then combine all your results into one uniform data set. If you are uh, looking at results from multiple search strings or multiple databases even, I would suggest you compile them all into one uniform data set so that you screen all the articles at one go and not look at different databases at once, uh, sorry, uh, one by one. Uh, if you are working with multiple people in your team, Google Sheets is good uh, to help you uh, collaborate with different people. Or if your, uh, say, your Microsoft Excel license allows you to collaborate with different people, that also works. But I would highly suggest you uh, make use of technology, say a software platform like the one I just demonstrated. It will really help you cut down on uh, time spent on, say, mundane tasks like uh, extracting information on, or consolidating them in one place. So uh, that would be my suggestion. I would also actually uh, recommend uh, using a reference manager. So that is something that we use in our team extensively. And that really helps us uh, organize our literature search results better in the sense any articles that need to be cited in the documents. Uh, I do not recommend citing articles manually. Uh, you can use there are lots of softwares out there in the market, say like EndNote or uh, Zotero which will help you uh, make this task way easier than uh, what you would do manually. So, yeah. OK, no, thank you for that guy. <laughs> um, next question here, somewhat related, of course. Um, can the technology platform search on multiple databases simultaneously? And can you expand on that feature? Uh, we actually do not encourage the platform to search simultaneously. Why? Because you can use the same search string on multiple databases, but uh, all these databases, say PubMed or uh, Prospero or Embase, they all interact with you differently. All of them will offer you a different set of filters that you can put on each of these databases to get to the results that you want. So uh, if the platform was to search on them uh, simultaneously, it would be a very raw search. You wouldn't really get any filters. So it would it is actually advisable to search on them uh, individually, not together. OK, got it. Um, can you also highlight the importance of a reference manager? Yeah, uh, like I mentioned, reference managers like uh, EndNote or Zotero or Mendeley uh, or RefWorks so uh, any document like the CER or your PSU or, or any document where you are using data from literature, it could be your state of the art section or it could be uh, the analysis of literature that you find from these literature searches. You will have to cite whatever information that you're putting. You'll have to put the reference of the article from where you took the information from. So uh, it is easy, say, if you have, say, maybe 20 articles max, but then, uh, you usually uh, will have 50 or even more references per document. And if you have to manage each of these references manually, it becomes very hard. Meaning I, uh, in a particular paragraph of text, I could have used five references. But uh, as in as in when I go along uh, building my report, I could add more text in the middle. So my sequence of references will change like uh, my first reference won't remain the first one anymore if I put something before it. So if I were to do this manually, I will have to change the numbering of each of these references myself and also do the same in the bibliography at the end. A reference manager will really help you because it uh, tags all of these references as field codes in the document. So field codes are uh, updated automatically as and when you prompt them. So once they are tagged as field codes, I don't have to manually change them anymore. The software will do it for us. OK, got it. Um, I, um, I do not think we have many more questions here. Is there anything else you want to expand on while we still have a few minutes here, Shruti? Uh, I would highly encourage uh, all the uh, 
participants in our call today to come and check out the platform. You can contact us for a demo. We can give you uh, a, a list of uh, all the features that we currently have and are planning to implement. I can also show you a couple of tricks, tips and tricks that we use on the platform to make our work easier. We, uh, I and my medical writing team use this platform extensively. We do all our literature searches on it. And we have noticed that we save quite a chunk of time when we perform our searches on the platform. So uh, I welcome you all to give it a uh, give it a try. Okay, great. Okay, great. Thank you again for your time today, Shruti, and the effort you put in for that wonderful presentation. Really do appreciate it, as well as the demo. Okay, so that will wrap up this session. I believe we have just about fifteen or so minutes until our final presentation of the day from Kablui's, Kablui Design's own Tom Kramer. So thank you again, Shruti, for your time. And I would, again, encourage anyone with any questions, feel free to reach out to myself or Shruti if you have any questions related to that presentation. Thanks again, Shruti. Yeah, and we'll be back in about 15 minutes for our final presentation of the day. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Goodbye. Bye-bye.